So if you listen to other videos, you have seen, realized that there are, has been quite a big progress in machine learning, particularly neural networks, the last 10 years or so. Um, so neural networks had a, had a big peak in the, probably the 90s. Then it was more or less replaced by other methods that we haven't covered here, but there are things like support vector machines, um, random forests, etc., that performed more or less as well. But then it has been a comeback from uh, neural networks starting in 2008 or something like that. And there have been a few people that have been very much pushing for this. And there has been both theoretical reasons, but, in, but also um, a number of more practical reasons, in particular that is nowadays very efficient to do neural network calculations on GPUs, so the graphic processors that are designed to make uh, computer games to work fast or graphics in general to work fast. And the reason because that is basically you can do all the calculations in neural network as a set of matrix multiplic multiplications, matrix manipulations. And that's exactly the same calculations as you do when you calculate uh, graphics. So that they are very efficient and they are of course mass produced for gaming. So they are quite cheap in comparison to other things. So nowadays that's what you use. So you can buy a, a good gaming PC and you have a good machine for running. Um, the machine the neural networks. And that has also resulted in that you can nowadays do much more deep networks, which is deep neural networks or deep learning in general. But there are a few fundamental things that we need to cover first to say that we, to understand why this has really happened. And a few things that we have actually some tweaks that is used for all types of neural networks, but they have uh, done that. And one of the problems is like basic regulation to that you have to have optimal uh, cost function and you have to avoid overfit. So you don't want to, in a machine learning method to just learn what you've seen, but also want to generalize. And this can be done in a number of tricks. I'll discuss a few of them here. And then the other thing is that what the problem is that you also want to learn fast. You don't want it to take thousands of epochs to learn. You want to learn fast. And of course, fast, that means you need to have a good derivative on the, on the, in the back propagation algorithm. If, you, if it's just very, very shallow, you will just search, search forever and get stuck. But uh, at the same time, it has to be relevant. So there are a few tricks beyond there that you, it's good to know about and that you will check in the lab. So normally, in this, you had like a cross, you had a um, square error function. So basically, you have the output minus the, uh, the cost for the error is something that you have the output minus the real value and square divided by the number of outputs you have on top. So the cost function you get to write, which is here. And if you do that, and if you are saying a single layer here, so this is very single layer, it's exemplified in the book that you have links on the web page. It takes several hundred nodes to learn because you particularly start far away from optimal value. And you don't, so this optimal value should be zero and sort of one. You take several hundred iterations to go there. However, if you use entropy, so if you know, remember from, I think from the MSA lecture, you talk about sequence logos and things, you know the entropy is basically that's how much information you have in in in, in, a, in an MSA or in anything. If you set as a cost function, you basically want, you don't want to minimize the error. You want to minimize the cross entropy, and it's formulated like that. So it's basically uh, uh, all right, it's not so obvious, but it's it's basically also the real value and the uh, value that you predict, and then you take the logarithm of this and divide the other two together. You see, you learn much, much faster. So you, you start learning directly, even if you start far away, and you actually get further closer down at the end. But if you kept on running the other one for another X number of iterations, you could learn it faster. So you have to change the N, N, N output function makes a difference. So that's something people learned and realized, and that's something now, you nowadays you do. The other problem that we always also discuss is very, very fundamental is the risk of worth fitting. So here is an example that they take also in this book. Is oh sorry, uh, is to have the accuracy on the training data goes up very very fast in the fifty epochs, basically one hundred percent from plus fifty percent. However, the test data goes up much lower. It doesn't go up to one hundred percent, and then it gets stuck to about eighty two percent, eighty two point two percent. Basically, you see that my first is happy kind of thing, but it takes almost three hundred epochs to reach that accuracy, and it gets stuck. And if you look at the cost, basically the sum of error that how much you learn it. You basically 
see that that is not improving at all. And maybe we'll take a validation set and start seeing this accuracy going down. So this is a problem of It works on the training data, but not on the test data. And how can we avoid that? So the traditional way was basically you stop here. Okay, I see I run X number of epochs and then I stop here, but it's quite inefficient because you need to know that in advance in general test data, you need to do cross validation and so on. So it would be better that you just learn in a good way. <coughs> and basically one way to learn in a good way is to try to use small uh, weights. If you have very big weights, you can very much because if you have small weights, that basically puts you more in the noisy thing. So that is used by either using L1 or L2 normalization. So, uh, so that basically means in both cases that the cost function is modified. So it adds something that's basically dependent on the size of all the weights. You have. So some of all the weights, and basically if they get big, you penalize that. So of course, if you need to have big ones to get very, very much improvement of the cost function, you will get um, uh, have a, uh, it will do that, but if it's just, it doesn't change the cost function performance so much, you will not do that. And that actually helps. You basically see here in this example, which is the same as the last one, you basically the accuracy test and training state data sort of follow each other. So, and it, it's sort of like, I mean, they start up to five, 10 or so, go fast. And even here, the accuracy keeps on going up all the way or to 400 data sets. That's one way. Another way to do it is actually good to which is very popular is the dropouts. That basically means that you skip some parts of the network in the training. So you just use some parts of it and you do it randomly in each iteration. And this basically is, is somehow is a way of training many different networks in parallel. And of course, but they're but not always the same. Or the, so basically you try to learn different parts of the network, learn the same thing. So that's why basically you could, should perform more uh, 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 yeah, um, more robust. So this is sort of an ensemble method in some way, but it, it, it's proven very good. So this is something you also play around with when you do the labs later. Okay, now on to the next problem. The next problem is that you have in um, uh, machine learning, you have often that you see that you train for many iterations and then fast you improve to something, and then you don't happen any longer here. And actually, if you look at uh, the different layers in networks, you have a la layer here network, you see that the uh, learning speed is close, uh, is highest close to the um, output layer, because that's your start the black propagation. But then further, if you have very deep networks, the learning gets very slow. But, and the reason for that is if you look at it, if it can be because we have a sigmoid function. Uh, and the derivative of the sigma function is very low unless you're close to basically zero or where every single function is cut off. Is. So basically, if you're far away from the optimal of understanding, you basically have very, very small derivatives. And then, of course, with small derivatives, you very much more changes, and means we need many, many epochs to learn it. So that is something I learned that the, the sigma function or even a tang h function is not a good. But if you use the real function, you see that if you are basically or zero, you're zero, you're zero, but if you're, you have a linear gradient. So basically, that gradient is higher, where, so it means you can learn much faster. So that's something that people use nowadays much more than the sigmoid and 10 H functions. Then basically, we have the deep learning. So basically, the idea is have to have some kind of convolutional networks, which have many, many layers. You can have them here, and you add layers in between. So you have many, many layers here, and then sort of make them smaller, bigger, and there's a lot of optimizing this. But this can learn much more complex features. So the idea here basically is that you don't need to encode different features can just provide more features that are, I mean, let the network figure out what the features use. And because you can do this faster learning, and because you GPU so faster train, and you can do this, uh, you don't have this problem with the vanishing gradient, you can actually train this quite efficiently. So this has been used for instance in Signal P6, also released last year. Uh, and that's similar to the, the target P problem we talked about before, but it's a version six, the other one was version one, I think we talked about. Or, or related. <coughs> so here they use a number of different tricks. They even use what's called a language model, which is like the model that is trained to predict itself, predict a sequence. You take away the A here in sequence and you turn, train it to predict A. And then use some other representations and they have these random fields networks uh, in this case, well, in this case, and then uh, you put this as an input and then you train as we did before, a method that uh, 
could recognize this single peptide and the cleavage site and so on, as, as we've discussed before. And uh, uh, it doesn't, it performs better, but the main difference is it performs much better for the rare target peptides. There are, there are these two old top peptides that are a bit different. <coughs> we have much fewer examples, and it performs much better for these than the old methods did. For the other ones, we have a lot of examples. It's, performs more or less the same, maybe slightly better, but not, not very, very good. No, very, very much better. Another example is uh, where people use a similar idea when you, you see a problem, you have a protein here, you have lots of different ways concatenated to make a very, very convolutionally very big one. And then you have something called LSTMs, which basically can go from one way to another one. And you also forward back and back and forward. And then you have these heated states and you have some kind of called attention, which is the, uh, layer, and then have a not layers. So you see many, many, you have four different types of layers, and you output in this case the subcell localization of a protein. So the input is a sequence, and you have this all this layer. So it's something people optimized and tried different things. You have here for some cases it's quite easy to realize you can have signal pepper at the end terms you recognize the signal. Other things with nuclear localization is much more diverse. You don't really know what you're looking for. So this is something you don't need to hard code, the network learns it itself. Okay, this is from the next section. We can skip this. Thank you.